or low income population, the harsher its penal system and the worse the living conditions inside its prisons. Rousseau again, one can formulate this proposition in the following terms. All efforts to reform the punishment of criminals are inevitably limited by the situation of the lowest socially significant proletarian class, which society wants to deter from criminal acts. All reform efforts, however humanitarian and well-meaning, which go beyond this restriction, are condemned to utopianism. In other words, you can never improve the conditions of prisoners to a point where people will prefer to go to prison rather than work for a minimum wage. This applies to welfare too, by the way, just in a different direction. Any welfare provision will always have to be lower than the lower, you know, than minimum wage. Otherwise, people would prefer to get welfare than work for a um, low wage. So he speaks of the situation of the lowest socially significant proletarian class. So according to the political economy of punishment, therefore, in order to make sense of the variations in penal severity, we need to look at that situation of the lowest socially significant proletarian class, the poorest and most marginalized groups of our society. So how do we measure the situation of the lowest uh, socially significant proletarian class. There are several ways to measure that condition and to look at that situation. Most um, political economists of punishment have been looking at rates of unemployment, trying to establish a relationship between unemployment and incarceration. But that's not the only possible measure. But it is one of the most relevant, because the higher, uh, you know, the, the, the larger the unemployed population is, uh, the lower the living standards, not just for the unemployed, but also for those who are employed at the lowest levels of the labor market, because there is a strong pressure from the unemployed on the employed, right? Um, what Marx called the Industrial Reserve Army of Labor. So some criminologists have looked at unemployment and imprisonment, finding that uh, you know, the higher the rates of unemployment, the higher the rates of incarceration, independent of crime. There is a direct relationship between the two. But you can also look, and criminologists have done this, at rates of welfare provision and incarceration. The lowest, the lower, um, you know, the, the rates of uh, welfare, uh, higher rates of incarceration. In the United States, for example, the expansion of the penal system has corresponded with the retraction of its welfare system. Social spending in the US has been reduced in order to fund mass incarceration. Uh, Western and Beckett, two authors, one of which we're going to have as a guest here on May 10th, found that imprisonment grew more in those US states which reduced welfare provisions more drastically. Finally, you can look at economic inequality and incarceration. Um, Bruce Western again found that higher levels of social inequality led to higher incarceration rates in the US. In turn, mass incarceration contributes to increase social inequality by broadening the distance between the poor and the um, middle or upper classes. Therefore, the political economy of punishment is not just about the economy and imprisonment. It takes welfare, social inequality, race, racism and racial segregation, and any other important indicator of the situation of the lowest socially significant proletarian class into account. Since the mid-1970s, Western societies, and particularly the US, have witnessed a dramatic process of transition from an industrial welfare model of capitalist development to a post-industrial neoliberal system of production. Although with different degrees of intensity, throughout the Western world, a neoliberal socioeconomic paradigm based on untempered global competition, free market, deregulation, privatization, and social disinvestment has supplanted the welfareist uh, social pact symbolized in the United States by Roosevelt's New Deal 
and later by Johnson's Great Society. Thus, in the last 30 years, social Darwinism has basically superseded social solidarity. Um, if you look at rates of unemployment in the United States, for example, you will see that they started to grow at the, in the early 1970s. They peaked in the uh, mid-late 80s, uh, and then they start going down again. Um, but this is really where mass incarceration happened, right, or started to unfold. Um, let's have a look at unionization rates, which also gives you a good, a good um, idea of the relative strength of the working class. I mean, not much to comment, right? Um, you can look at uh, income inequalities and you know, rates of poverty in the United States. Uh, poverty rates and, and the percentage, both in terms of percentage and, and, and numbers, had been going down uh, after, you know, you know, throughout the 1960s, and then we see it um, increasing again since the, the early 1970s. So, and of course, income inequality and income gap um, will change accordingly. Right. So basically, um, everything seems to have changed since the early 1970s. The big, uh, the big crisis and capitalist restructuring of the 1970s. So these structural transformations have dramatically worsened the situation of the lowest socially significant proletarian class of which Georg Ruschen was speaking in the United States. So in this respect, following the political economy of punishment, it is perfectly understandable that a punitive turn started to unfold in the United States when it did, in the early 70s. This was a period of major capitalist restructuring, deindustrialization, globalization, deregulation, um, the rise of a dual economy, service economy, flexible production, low wage labor markets, unprotected labor markets, and so on. The main victims so to speak, of this major restructuring of the economy where Americans poor, Americans poor. And more specifically, it's black and Latino urban poor. These were the ones whose manufacturing jobs were lost, whose wages went down, whose welfare rights were abolished, whose educational programs were slashed, and whose overall conditions of segregated poverty intensified rather than decreased. Not unlike their 19th century ancestors who were forced through penal violence into the emerging industrial economy of Northern England, America's poor were the ones who in the 1980s and 1990s had to be forced into an emerging post-industrial economy based on low wage, insecure labor markets and deregulated working conditions. Once again, the penal system gave its substantial contribution to ease that transition, so to speak. It declared war against the poor. It stigmatized them as dangerous, it confined an astonishing number of them in prison, and it further reduced their socioeconomic status. It disenfranchised them in the millions, and most importantly, it threatened with the same fate all those who would not conform to the neoliberal imperative of low wage and deregulated work. So this is what I have been doing between 2000 and 2005. Then back to Italy uh, after my PhD, um, rather happily. Uh, I, I, I was lucky enough to uh, you know, be able to, to, to um, you know, immerse myself in a network of research and activism, not just in Italy, but also in Spain, in Latin America, and this allowed me to basically to get published, to get published a lot, and to get you know uh, to to, to um, you know to be able to to translate parts of my uh, book and and my research into other languages. And this is why you mentioned lots of books; most of them are translations of the same thing. Um, to, be, to be very honest, um, to be very honest with you, but that's cool still, right? Um, so, that was our secret thing. Yes, 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 exactly. So, uh, I, I kept working on the sociology of punishment, on mass incarceration. I kept, uh, you know, trying to merge my research and my militancy. Uh, and I started focusing on immig immigrants' rights. Uh, I saw 
immigration and labor migrations really as the uh, as a case study for these ideas. I, I started thinking that uh, global um, labor migrations were really the latest uh, example of this lowest socially significant proletarian class that we try to deter and regulate by punitive means. Um, and so we get to um, 2006. Um, we get to uh, 2006, and I was uh, unhappy again in Italy. Uh, because I couldn't find a stable position in the university. One day, my current wife, girlfriend at the time, uh, Stefania, uh, who was doing a PhD in sociology at the University of Padua in Italy, came back home with a flyer about an exchange program between uh, Italian universities and the UC system. And she said, well, you know what? I'm thinking of applying. And I said, OK, do that. That's, that's nice. Um, she applied, and she got the exchange program. And at that point, I got so uh, I freaked out. Um, well, I thought she's going to leave, and she's going to be away for months and months. So I should follow. Um, and that's how I actually made contact with the Center for the Study of Law and Society, uh, where I had contacts with with some of the professor uh, professors there. And so I managed to get an unpaid visiting scholarship, which is basically. Um, a way to say, okay, come over, um, you know, and do your own things. So I applied, I got the visiting, um, the visiting scholarship, um, and then I met Mona Lich, who uh, was the chair of the Justice Studies Department until 2007, 2008. Um, a sociologist of punishment, same kinds of research interests, and I got invited to a conference that was organized by the Justice Studies Department at the time, in 2007, um, called Penal California, Tracing Its Origins, Sketching Its Future. I can't, I can't forget that conference, because that was really my first uh, contact ever with Justice Studies and, and with this university. So I, I gave my talk, and then Mona told me that they, that, that they, had, some, they had two positions um, coming up. And she suggested that I apply, and this is how we got actually the jobs, right, Daniel? Yeah. Um, so I applied, and I finally found my casa, I should say, right? Uh, <laughs> my home. So, and I've been living happily in Oakland and, and working very happily in the Justice Studies Department at this